on that. So I'll just hand over to, to Kay. I thought Greece was wonderful. <laughs> um, my husband started to show signs of memory loss um, when he was 62, approximately. Perhaps I began to see the signs that things were not right. I made a booking to go out for dinner in a quiet restaurant. I was going to broach the subject. He sat down and he said, not going to get any better, is it? I asked what wasn't going to get better and he said, my memory, of course. I didn't realise he knew. We immediately sought help. We thought brain tumours, we thought all sorts. I think he had every test known to man. Nothing definite was forthcoming. In 2005, he had a pacemaker put in. His pulse rate had dropped to 25 from his usual 40. He started having, as I described, grey turns. No diagnosis was made of these. He would feel nauseous, lose colour, perhaps sweat. Turn would pass, but he never actually vomited. After the pacemaker, his pulse rate was a steady 60 to 65, and I used to tease him, saying, you know, I was going to sell your heart afterwards as hardly used, and now it's racing on. <laughs> but we do these things. Anyway, um, when I took his blood pressure during these turns, it was always high. I gradually noticed that he would forget anything recent that had happened right up to the turn. And then some would come back, but never completely. I believe these were, as his grandmother and his mother had had, is transient ischemic attacks. I believe his illness, I believed his illness was of a vascular nature. We continued to have tests, one of which he had to stay awake for 24 hours. That was fun. We were put on Aricep, the Mementine, but nothing improved and nothing seemed to slow down. I believe, though I may be wrong, someone will enlighten me, but I think these drugs are not of use with the vascular form. We'll see. I think it was late in 2005 that Angus had numerous memory tests to see what deterioration had taken place. One test showed a six-sided figure, and he was asked to do another. He didn't draw it, he just wrote times two. I thought it was quite smart, but the, the person didn't. Uh, <laughs> no advice was given. And um, afterwards, it was all over in a couple of minutes. We, he has Alzheimer's disease, possibly of a vascular nature. Goodbye. That was it. Nobody told us what we should do. Nobody said where we should go. And we were out of that. Um, so we decided that we would go forward doing the things we always did, which was work. We would continue to perform the duties that his position demanded. Later, if he was asked if he'd visited such and such a place, he might say no. I asked him later, did he want to be reminded? Yes, he said, I want In 2007, he wrote to his directors explaining his problems and how he wanted things to be. He joked about Tony Blair and George Bush and stem cell research. We put in place wills and, of course, we had power of attorney for each other. If only we had had someone to see us and explain how we could plan what we might do, what we might want to do. I know when I worked in the hospice, we would ask people if there was anything they'd wanted to try. Well, we might have had that family holiday, which might have been a good memory, but we didn't. But however, uh, we should also have claimed benefits and found out how to go about things and get care. Our life did gradually change, but it was still full of love and laughter, and he kept his wicked sense of humour. He was a gentle gentleman. I only ever heard him speak poorly of two people, and one was Maggie Thatcher. <laughs> Two things he hated were pomposity and cruelty. So when his nature sometimes changed and he was angry and annoyed, we discovered that it was quite often a urinary tract infection that was the cause and quite easily solved if you noticed it. Angus passed away on the 5th of June 2010. The year before he died was difficult in parts and happy in others. In 2009, we asked for help with the drugs. We'd been through so many problems with fear, aggression, caused by fear and frustration, and in one case, a drug that he'd been put on. But we'd come out the other side. No wonder he was frustrated. He couldn't use a computer. He couldn't read. He couldn't write. Then he couldn't find his words. I was often afraid, as the family knew the drugs he was on and looked up the Internet, and they would say, you know, he shouldn't be on these. There are side effects. I knew this, but... 
we did need appropriate medicine to help us. You see, it affects all the family. Our GP thought the psychiatrist could help and arranged that she come to see us. That was in April 2009. She arrived with another woman. She suggested it would be best if Angus came in for 48 hours. He looked at me and he said, should I? And I said, well, if it's only 48 hours, I think you should. God forgive me. It was only two days he was there. But they allowed him to drive himself in, so he couldn't have been that much of a danger. And when we'd been there about ten minutes, I was asked to go next door with a doctor to sign the admission form. I said, I really must go and see if he's all right, because I haven't spoken to him properly. He, I, I went with him, and I, when I went through, I heard him shouting, K, K. And I said, it's all right, come on, we'll sit down. We sat down, and he still was upset. And I said, look, darling, you're here voluntarily. You don't have to stay. You can come home. The psychiatrist said, no, he can't. He's here sectioned for 28 days. I said, why? What for? I couldn't understand. I was told I could take him out for a walk, but he had to come back. I could have told them, as he'd asked me, that he was terrified of being locked in and he hated hospital. I was, nothing was explained to me. I was not asked to sign anything. I have his notes now from the hospital. You know there is no space for a carer or the power of attorney to sign that they understand. I'm not saying that we could refuse. I understand that that can happen. There's a box they can tick to say someone's been told, but that's all. So the second day of his stay, his speech was slurred and he was unsteady. I asked to have him home. No was the answer. The next day his walking was worse and I told the staff that whatever he was on, he should be, on, should be reduced. My daughter, his daughters arrived with the grandchild and they asked if I would stay till they left as they hated to see him upset. I stayed, but when I left, I looked back at the window. He was on the windowsill, trying to get out. I ran to the door and he was alert enough to see me do that. He pushed through the staff and into my arms outside. Take me, take me. They had dragged him away, back through the door, and I had to leave. How they settled him that night, I don't know. He was a big, strong man. The next day I made up my mind that I would take him out for lunch and I would not come back. We would disappear or I would call the press to witness what was happening to us. Fortunately, my daughter who works in the psychiatric hospital and her husband, a retired psychiatrist, told me that what I had to do was to ask him if he could, ask if he could get home first and foremost. And then if they refused, which they would, I was to ask to have him home on a pass. The psychiatrist turned on her heel when I mentioned the word pass, and the male nurse winked at me, and I thought, I'm in with a chance here. So that was all right. And she came back. She said, it's not doing any good having him here anyway. I turned to Angus and said, oh, we can go home. She said, not so fast. You'll have to have 24-hour care in the home from now on, or we'll take him back and he won't be able to drive again. I said I would have 24-hour care in hand within the hour. She said, well, I need names, addresses, and telephone numbers. I said, you will have that. I remember them making a joke about the name of an agency I was using. It was Miracle Workers. But I knew then, if this could happen to the Premier Duke of Scotland, God help Joe Bloggs. He never made up what he lost. In August that year, he fell and fractured his femur. He was admitted to accident and emergency, and they were very good with him. They spoke to him and asked if they could talk to the person that was with him. I was in Aberdeen that day. I was taking my sister into the hospice. But however, when I got there, Alison, whom I think some of you know, Alison Senior, was with Angus and waiting for me. I asked if I could come in in the morning early because he was first on the list and I could help keep him calm while they were doing other things. No. I, I came in anyway. He, I, he heard an old lady shouting, help me, 
help me. And he pushed me towards her voice. He listened. He could hear. After the op, he was in a side room. And at 8.30pm, I was asked to leave as he'd been very patient with me. I wasn't causing a disturbance. Rather the opposite. When I was told he would receive no sedation until I left, I explained he would get out of the bottom of the bed. And the nurse replied, with a fractured femur. I said, he doesn't know he has a fractured femur. I explained that he'd managed to pass 700 mils of urine that was in the sluice. I asked that they did not put in a catheter, as he would forget and just pull it straight out. The doctor had advised that he was drinking so well he would not require fluids. When I returned at a.m., he'd had an incident. He fell. He'd pulled out his urinary catheter and was bleeding per urethra. He'd intervene as fluids, as he wouldn't drink. I'd only left him at 9 p.m., and this was 7.30. He looked totally devastated and lost. I waited until the doctor came round and asked how things were. This time, I said, pretty bad. I said, if you want this ward to go down as the ward that killed the Duke of Hamilton, that's what will happen. Everyone knows that Angus and I never stood on ceremony. We never used titles. We were Angus and Kay to everyone. But I felt I had to pull out the stops then. After this, we were allowed to take in memory books and a nurse was taken in from the bank, although we were perfectly willing to take it in turns to stay with him overnight. We're in the side room. <coughs> Early in the evenings, we would go down, chat with him or take him down to the cafe and his friend and his son would have him doing wheelies in the wheelchair along the corridor and he loved that. It amused him. We also played soft operatic music late in the evening, which settled not only him, but the old lady in the next room, who was rather confused. And she said, is there an opera singer in here? And she slept too. One night, they were going to give him a suppository last thing, and I said, would it be better to wait until morning when I come in, because he's had his sedation? So they did, but they gave it early. So when I arrived... Of course, he was sitting in his own feces. He didn't want me to help, but I said, you've helped me before, dear. We're in this together. And we took the Zimmer through to the loo, got him changed, got his pyjamas, dressing gown, warm wrap around him, down to get the coffee and pastries. One of the nurses in the ward was extremely good. Her uncle had just died, and she was very understanding. And we found the physiotherapists were very good. Tell me, why is it that a member of the family or a carer cannot be allowed to stay with a vulnerable adult? Sick children's hospitals allow it. Surely it can be done somehow. We and our loved ones only need two things, to be listened to and to receive loving kindness. What has gone wrong? I'm a nurse. Is nurse training in university wanting in the basic nursing department, the carers, I'm not damning nurses or saying it was the good old days. I remember giving sterile waters painkilling injections because their morphine wasn't due. I remember tying patients to beds because well, there was only two of us on duty and one was away for lunch and he was going to kill the patient in the next bed. You tied him with his dressing gown cord or a crepe bandage. Yes, it wasn't the good old days, but this is 2011. A matron I knew after a stay in hospital, said, ah, but I knew the kind hands. I apologise for all the down things I've said, but I guess this is the challenge, to improve things, to keep up the momentum, and soon to tackle the mental health hospitals. I'd like to add one sentence I heard two days ago, and it was from the principal of the new veterinary school in Edinburgh. She said, the student will be in a room right next to their patients so they won't be separate, they'll be working with them. Have we got away from this too much in training? Do we leave... Are we too good to nurse the basic nursing care? Is it someone else that does it? I don't know. There are many things we could say, but time doesn't allow, and I thank you all very much for listening.
and I know it'll improve. It's improving already. Henry. <laughs>